in this series, we have been studying about the root of Sabbath keeping. We entitled it, Enter into His Rest. We talked about true conversion. We talked how the Sabbath is a memorial of the creative power of God in our life. If we don't have that experience, we cannot even think about truly keeping the Sabbath properly. Today we're going to study about how to keep the Sabbath. Now, before we go into a how, the specific point, let us consider what is the Sabbath. You see, God has a people on this earth. Those people are identified as reformers. Let's look at Isaiah 58, verse 12. It talks about this people. What are they doing? Isaiah 58, verse 12 says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, they shall raise up the foundation of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. We're talking about a people that are doing a work of restoration. They are doing a work of repairing that which was broken down. And what was the breach that they were specifically to repair? Verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on mine holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor Him. Not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. We find that these reformers or these restorers in the last days, their special work of restoration is to be done in regards to the Sabbath day. So now, let us consider why the Sabbath must be restored. Let's look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus gives us an offer. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We find here that Jesus is calling us to find rest in Him. What is this yoke that produces this rest? Let's look at those passages that we've been using from time to time in this series. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. We find that there is an old path. There is a good way. And we need to walk in that old way in order to find rest for our souls. Now we know the oldest path to find in is in the Garden of Eden. In that old path, we find in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the establishment of the Sabbath day, a memorial of that true rest in which we enter in with the Lord. Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3 says, And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. So here was the institution of the Sabbath right there in the Garden of Eden. Now this Sabbath was not only given to us to rest in. The Sabbath was given to us as a sign. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20 about the special sign that God has given to us in the Sabbath day. Ezekiel 20 verse 20 says, And hallow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. We find here that the Sabbath day was given to us. We are to hallow the Sabbath. Why? Because it is a sign between God and His people. That we may know that the Lord is our God. Now, what is this a sign of? A sign of what? God gave the Sabbath for us to remember something. Before we get to the remembrance of creation aspect of it. Let us look at Deuteronomy chapter 5 
verses 12 through 15. There we find the repetition of the Ten Commandments as given on Mount Sinai. There are only five. Verse 12 through 14 talk about the seventh day Sabbath. And now notice verse 15. After speaking about the seventh day, he says, And remember that thou wast the servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Now why did God command the children of Israel to keep the Sabbath? According to this verse, it is because God brought them out of Egypt. In the Bible, we find that Egypt has a spiritual meaning. Egypt is a symbol of sin. And when God delivers us from sin, when Jesus Christ saves us, in that saving process, He gives us the Sabbath to remind us that we were taken out from sin. Furthermore, the Sabbath was also given to us as a sign of creation. Let's read the Sabbath commandment. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. We find again the purpose of the Sabbath. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. And now notice verse 11. For or because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rest of the seventh day. Wherefore, Lord, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice here, the reason given here for the Sabbath takes us right back there to the Garden of Eden. Because God created the heaven and earth in six days, and on the seventh day, He rested. Well, there is a more important rest more important creativeness that we need to remember. Not only creation 6,000 years ago, but let's look at Psalm 51, verse 10, where it says there, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, here we find that the Sabbath is a reminder not only of creation 6,000 years ago, but creation at the time of our conversion. That's the purpose of the seventh-day Sabbath. For that reason, a mere profession of Sabbath keeping is of no value with God. Let's look at on the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, we consider verse 20. When we talk about Sabbath keeping, we all know we should do that. I mean, as we are as Adventists anyway. As we study the Bible, we can really easily see that Sabbath keeping is something that is clearly brought out. We can see that quite simply. But the question comes to us, how to do it? We used to talk about the Pharisees. We don't want to be like the Pharisees, do we? Why not? Was their observance very strict on the Sabbath? Let's look at Matthew 5, verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine that? If we are to keep the Sabbath holy, we are to do it better than the scribes and Pharisees. Why are we to do it better than the scribes and Pharisees? For what reason? Well, let's look at Matthew 23. What was the problem with the scribes and Pharisees? How did they keep the law of God? Matthew 23, 1 to 3. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. What was the problem with Pharisaism? It was not strict obedience. It was strict teaching, but not obedience. In Desire of Ages, page 309, paragraph 2. We read, what was the greatest deception in the time of Christ? 
No greater deception than this one. And this can be among us today. We who are looking forward to the coming of Christ. We who are claiming to keep the Sabbath. We who are claiming to be Adventists. Those waiting for the second coming of Christ. What can be our deception? Desire Ages 309. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. That was the greatest deception. And what about today? Do you think that's the greatest deception today? The greatest profession of the religion? Yes, we can have profession of the religion of Christ. We can profess to be Sabbath keepers. But what about the reality part? What about the practical aspect of it? You see, we find in the last days the deceptions will come to the world. Do you think we're going to be deceived? We who know the truth, we who know the signs of the times, we who know the last events of earth's history, do you think we can be deceived? Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why is it that people will receive a strong delusion and believe an actual lie? How can you and I actually believe a lie? We know the truth today. Can we believe a lie? Well, it says here, God will send them a strong delusion. But to whom does God send a strong delusion? Notice the words, for this cause in verse 11. For which cause? The cause is found in verse 10. And verse 10 says, because they receive not the love of the truth. My question is, do you love the truth? Do I love the truth? My dear friends, as, oh, it's only as we actually love the truth that we will not be deceived. If we only take it from a mere intellectual aspect, yeah, you can't, you, we can clearly see in the Bible that the seventh day is the Sabbath. I'm convinced it's not enough. We must come to the point to love that fact that God has revealed to us. But now when we talk about loving it, we must love how much of it. We remember James 2 verse 10. We quote it oftentimes to others. But we need to read it for ourselves. James 2 and verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, when we're speaking about Sabbath keeping, we're talking about keeping all of the Sabbath commandment. So now, what is proper Sabbath keeping? We just read the fourth commandment a moment ago. I would just like to read from volume 6, page 353. Why is it important in establishing new churches, new interests, new members? Why is it important to give instruction? Not only that we should keep the Sabbath, but how to keep the Sabbath. Let me read. In establishing new churches, ministers should give careful instruction as to the proper observance of the Sabbath. We must be guarded lest the lax practices that prevail among Sunday keepers shall be followed by those who profess to observe God's holy rest day. The line of demarcation is to be made clear and distinct between those who bear the mark of God's kingdom and those who bear the sign of the kingdom of rebellion. There must be a distinction here. We are not to start keeping the Sabbath like Sunday keepers keep Sundays. The lax practices are not to be among us. There must be a line of them in distinction, not only in the day of the week, but how we treat that day of the week. Furthermore, far more sacredness is attached to the Sabbath than is given by many professed Sabbath keepers. The Lord has been greatly dishonored by those who have not kept the Sabbath according to the commandment either in the letter or in the spirit. 
He calls for a reform in the observance of the Sabbath. So we as reformers must now understand what Sabbath reform is all about. What is proper Sabbath observance? Keep in mind, in early writings, page 33, as it talks about the final events of this earth's history, what brings about the great persecution of the people of God? What brings about the final crisis on this earth's history? Let's read it. I saw that God has children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. So here you find that the people of God are filled with the Holy Spirit. And what do they do? They now begin to do what? Proclaim the Sabbath more fully. You can't proclaim something you don't have already. So now, in proclaiming the Sabbath more fully, what happens? It says, This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. So what enrages the churches? It is a clear presentation of the Sabbath truth. The Sabbath is proclaimed more fully. So now, when does Sabbath observance begin? Proper Sabbath observance we're talking about. Well, let us begin with the Sabbath commandment itself. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then notice the next part. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. In other words, six days of labor is involved in proper Sabbath observance. If we don't work six days, you cannot rest the seventh day. You don't rest and then labor. No, you labor and then you are in need of rest. Now when we deal with the actual Sabbath itself, the seventh day, the Sabbath does not begin until the evening. Let's look at Genesis 1 verse 31. Genesis 1 verse 31. When the seven days were originally instituted, you look at each of the days and they end in this fashion. And God saw everything that He had made and behold it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So notice here, when we deal with the biblical day, it says evening and then the morning. And then the next evening begins the next day. We find this also in Nehemiah chapter 13. When they were talking, about restoring the Sabbath in his day. We read in Nehemiah 13 and verse 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged, etc. And we'll come to this a little bit later on. Notice here, the gates when? Began to be dark. So Sabbath observance began when? when it began to get dark. For that reason, when the Jews were keeping the yearly festivals, especially the Day of Atonement, which was considered a Sabbath, we find what was the manner of keeping that one in Leviticus 23, verse 32. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even until even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So the celebration of the Sabbath or the Sabbath rest was to be kept when? From even until even. So we find here so far that it involves six days of work. So God's people are a working people. It involves the actual rest is from evening to evening. Or in other words, from sunset to sunset. So as the sun goes down on Friday evening, that is when the Sabbath begins. And the Sabbath does not finish until the sun is set on Saturday evening. Now the Bible also talks about a special day. Although all week is a time to prepare for the Sabbath, there is one day that is specially a day to make the, such a preparation. Mark chapter 15 and verse 42. It says, And now when the even was come, 
because it was the preparation. That is the day before the Sabbath. So in the Bible, it refers to a day called the preparation. Or in other words, the preparation day. Now, when is this preparation day? This preparation day is the day before the Sabbath. So the day before the Sabbath is the day that we specially make preparation. What is to be done on this day before the seventh day Sabbath? The sixth day of the week. What is to be done on this day? Let's look at Exodus 16, 22 and 23. What type of things are to be done on that day to get us specially ready for the seventh day of the week? Exodus 16, verses 22 and 23. And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread. Two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord had said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, then that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. So according to these verses, the preparation day, in preparation for the Sabbath, certain things are to be done. Among them, it says all the baking is to be done, and it says seed that which you will seed. Now what does it mean to seed? Well, seed means to boil. That's right, to boil something. So if, in other words, all food preparation is to be done on this preparation day. There is no actual food preparation on the Sabbath day to make something to be eaten. Let's look at Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 225 to 26. The Lord is no less particular now in regard to His Sabbath than when He gave the foregoing special directions to the children of Israel. He required them to bake that which they would bake and seed, that is boil, that which they would seed on the sixth day, preparatory to the rest of the Sabbath. Those who neglect to prepare for the Sabbath on the sixth day, and who cook food upon the Sabbath, violate the fourth commandment, and are transgressors of God's law. Now, that's what it says here. If we cook on the Sabbath, we are violating the Sabbath. All who are really anxious to observe the Sabbath according to the commandment will not cook any food upon the Sabbath. Is this clear? Whoever wants to keep the Sabbath will not cook any food on the Sabbath. That's right. All that must be done beforehand. They will in the fear of that God who gave His law from Sinai deny themselves and eat food prepared upon the sixth day even if it is not so palatable. That's right. Even if it doesn't taste as good, they're going to do it. God forbade the children of Israel baking and boiling upon the Sabbath. That prohibition should be regarded by every Sabbath keeper as a solemn injunction from Jehovah to them. The Lord would guard His people from indulging in gluttony upon the Sabbath, which He has set apart for sacred meditation and worship. We serve the same God as the children of Israel did on Mount Sinai. Actually, this was even before Mount Sinai. Exodus 16 is before they even entered the wilderness of Sinai. God gave special direction to His people. What happens if we don't finish everything in time for Sabbath? Well, we are to follow the example that was done on the very first Sabbath in the New Testament. I'm talking about New Testament being after the death of Christ. Christ died, and the very next day was the Sabbath. And how was that Sabbath kept? Let's take a look. Luke 23, verse 54. We'll read to Luke 24, verse 1. And that day was the preparation the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the command. So here they were preparing spices and ointments for the burial of Jesus Christ. And what they, as they were working, the Sabbath came upon them. So what did they do? 
they still rested according to the commandments after the death of Christ. Verse 1, next chapter. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Notice here, they did not finish working with everything on the Sabbath. They said, oh, this is an important event, let's go finish our job. No, they rested according to the commandment. So if something is unfinished on preparation, they leave it alone until the Sabbath is over, just like these women did. Also, the Sabbath says, the commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why are we to remember it? Volume 6, 353. At the very beginning of the fourth commandment, the Lord said, remember. He knew that amid the multitude of cares and perplexities, man would be tempted to excuse himself from meeting the full requirement of the law or would forget its sacred importance. Therefore, he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We need to remember the Sabbath. When? Just on Friday, sunset? Bottom of the page. All through the week, we are to have the Sabbath in mind and be making preparation to keep it according to the commandment. That's right. Saturday night after sunset, we are to make our plans in such a way that the Sabbath will be kept. And if we make our plans all week in preparation for the seventh day Sabbath, we will be ready for it. Further on, we are not merely to observe the Sabbath as a legal matter. We are to understand its spiritual bearing upon all the transactions of life. All who regard the Sabbath as a sign between them and God, showing that He is the God who sanctifies them, will represent the principles of His government. They will bring into daily practice the laws of His kingdom. Daily it will be their prayer that sanctification of the Sabbath may rest upon them. Every day they will have the companionship of Christ and will exemplify the perfection of His character. Every day their light will shine forth to others in good works. So every single day we are preparing to keep the Sabbath day holy, especially in the family circle. On the next page it says, in all that pertains to the success of God's work, the very first victories are to be won in the home life. Here the preparation for the Sabbath must begin. Throughout the week let parents remember that their home is to be a school in which their children shall be prepared for the courts above. Let their words be right words. No words which their children should not hear are to escape their lips. Let the spirit be kept free from irritation. Parents, during the week, live as in the sight of a holy God who has given you children to train for Him. Train for Him the little church in your home, that on the Sabbath all may be prepared to worship in the Lord's sanctuary. A lot of our problems in church are because there's problems in the home. If our children will learn about the Sabbath in the home, we will not have all the problems that we do have in the church. Each morning and evening, present your children to God as His blood-bought heritage. Teach them that it is their highest duty and privilege to love and serve God. We need to make sure that when we deal with the Sabbath day, the temporal things do not encroach upon the Sabbath hours. Volume 6, page 354. When the Sabbath is thus remembered, the temporal will not be allowed to encroach upon the spiritual. No duty pertaining to the six working days will be left for the Sabbath. During the week, our energies will not be so exhausted in temporal labor that on the day when the Lord rested and was refreshed, we shall be too weary to engage in His service. Now this is a major part. We talked at the very beginning of this section here about the Sabbath rest is not for lazy people. We talk about six days laboring and working. Many times we as Adventists and especially Reformers, we are hard-working people. And Satan will tempt us in this line to work so hard during the week that when the Sabbath comes we are exhausted. We have no more energies to share in the work of God. We need to keep in mind that this is not the plan of God. 
God's plan rather is that we need to so calculate our labor during the six working days that we will have still plenty of energy to worship and to serve God on His holy day. A few more things on what to be done on this preparation day. Volume 6, 354-355. Well, preparation for the Sabbath is to be made all through the week. Friday is to be the special preparation day. Through Moses, the Lord said to the children of Israel, Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and see that you will see. And that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept up until the morning. And the people went about and gathered it, and ground it in mills, or beat it in the mortar, and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it. There was something to be done in preparing the heaven-sent bread for the children of Israel. The Lord told them that this work must be done on Friday, the preparation day. This was a test to them. God desired to see whether or not they would keep the Sabbath holy. So this was their test to see whether they would keep the Sabbath or not. And they would do this on Friday, the preparation day. Now they were also to appear before the Lord a certain way. 355, volume 6. Many need instruction on how they should appear in the assembly for worship on the Sabbath. Did you know there's a right way to appear before the Lord in, on Sabbath and there's a wrong way? Notice here, they are not to enter the presence of God in the common clothing worn during the week. That's right. Your common weekly clothing is not to enter the church. It says here, all should have a special Sabbath suit to be worn when attending service in God's house. Well, we should not conform to worldly fashions. We are not to be indifferent in regard to our outward appearance. We are to be neat and trim, though without adornment. The children of God should be pure within and without. Sometimes I see people, during the week in their work, they dress nicely. They wear a nice suit. And on Sabbath they come in their work clothes. I'm sorry, that is violation of the Sabbath commandment. We are to have the best for God. Even though we are not to conform to worldly fashions, yet when we appear before the Lord in His house, we need to have our best suit, a Sabbath suit specifically worn for that occasion. Now some specific things here. 355 to 356. On Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. See that all the clothing is in readiness and that all the cooking is done. Let the boots be blacked and the baths be taken. It is possible to do this. If you make it a rule, you can do it. The Sabbath is not to be given to the repairing of garments, to the cooking of food, to pleasure seeking or to any other worldly employment. Before the setting of the sun, let all secular work be laid aside and all secular papers be put out of sight. Parents, explain your work and its purpose to your children and let them share in your preparation to keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. Our clothing is to be have in readiness. All the cooking is to be done. All the shoes to be clean. All the baths to be taken. When? Sabbath morning? No, 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 no. Let the baths be taken when? On the preparation day. All secular work is to be laid aside. It is interesting that not only is the valley bathing to be done and the shoes to be clean. In Signs of the Times, May 25th, 1882, it says, many carelessly put off blackening their boots and shaving until after the beginning of the Sabbath. This should not be. So we're talking about cleaning for preparation day. It means our baths to be taken, the shaving to be done, all that when? Not on the Sabbath day. That's not Sabbath work. That is preparation day work. That means there's no need for showers Sabbath morning. 
There is need for all that when? On the preparation day. No need for shavers coming out. No need for those type of things. That is sa preparation day work. On the Sabbath, we don't need to spend our time on such things. Furthermore, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 233 to 234. We talk about the clothing. What kind of clothing are we to bring to God on His holy day? The people, when it talks about the uh, children of Israel, actually, let's read that first. Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. In preparation for God speaking to them on Mount Sinai, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So there was three days before the, the meeting of God on Mount Sinai. God told the children of Israel, make sure you are ready for His day when He meets with His people and gives them His law. And among the issues of preparing for the Lord to meet with His people was clean clothing. That means on the Sabbath day, we must come before the Lord with clean clothing. Clean bodies and clean clothing. It says here, The people were required to refrain from worldly labor and care and to possess devotional thoughts. God required them also to wash their clothes. He is no less particular now than He was then. He is a God of order. And those who worship God with uncleanly garments and persons do not come before Him in an acceptable manner. If we come before the Lord in unclean garments or unclean persons, God does not accept such coming before Him. He is not pleased with their lack of reverence for Him. And He will not accept the service of filthy worshipers, for they insult their Maker. When we come before God in unclean clothing and unclean bodies, we are insulting our Creator. And it says here, He will not accept the services of filthy worshipers. The Creator of the heavens and the earth considered cleanliness of so much importance that He has said, and let them wash their clothes. I remember seeing a person working so late on Friday on a construction job. He came in just before the Sabbath, and he ran inside his room, took off his work clothes, and put on Sabbath clothing. I'm sorry. That was not accepted by God. We must clean the body, and we must clean our clothes, and be ready before the Lord. That's why preparation day is so important. Page 356, we're told, we should jealously guard the edges of the Sabbath. So on preparation day, we must make plans to guard the edges of the Sabbath, not to come up just to the Sabbath, just on time. Remember that every moment is consecrated holy time. Whenever it is possible, employers should give their workers the hours from Friday noon until the beginning of the Sabbath. Give them time for preparation, that they may welcome the Lord's day with quietness of mind. By such a course, you will suffer no loss, even in temporal things. So now there's another work to be done on Preparation Day too. A work among the church. On page 356 of Volume 6 it says, There is another work that should receive attention on the Preparation Day. When? On the Preparation Day. On this day, all differences between brethren, whether in the family or in the church, should be put away. That's right. On the Preparation Day, all differences must be settled. Don't wait till the Sabbath hours for that. Let all bitterness and wrath and malice be expelled from the soul. In a humble spirit, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. You see, this is carrying out the principle found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. It says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother have aught against thee, 
Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. In other words, if we are not reconciled on preparation day, and we enter upon the Sabbath hours unreconciled, God does not accept it. In the Desire of Ages, page 311, it says, God requires them to do all in their power to restore harmony. Until they do this, He cannot accept their services. God does not accept the services in His house unless this work is done. In volume 5, page 646, it says, If you have wronged your brother by word or deed, you are first to be reconciled to him before your worship will be acceptable to heaven. Before heaven accepts our services, we must settle our differences. Another statement, volume 6, 356. Before the Sabbath begins, the mind as well as the body should be withdrawn from worldly business. That's right. Worldly affairs, the concerns of this life, should be withdrawn before the Sabbath. God has set His Sabbath at the end of six working days that men may stop and consider what they have gained during the week in preparation for the pure kingdom which admits no transgressor. We should each Sabbath reckon with our souls to see whether the week that has ended has brought spiritual gain or loss. So in other words, on Friday evening, as the Sabbath is beginning, we need to stop and evaluate our spiritual condition that week. Have we improved or have we gone back? That's a time for spiritual reckoning. Signs of the Times, May 25th, 1882. Then around the family altar, all should wait to welcome God's holy day as they would watch for the coming of a dear friend. We need to learn the beauties of the Sabbath to such an extent. The Sabbath should be so pleasurable to us that when we are waiting there Friday evening for the sun to set, that we are eagerly waiting for Christ, for the Sabbath, as the coming of a dear friend. So now, what are we not to do on the Sabbath? We just talked about the preparation day. Now let's consider what is not to be done on the Sabbath. Let's consider. Well, we already read in Exodus 16, no cooking, right? No cooking, no baking. All the food preparation is to be done on the sixth day. All this type of stuff, you know. Sometimes I see people all there. You want popcorn on the Sabbath? Go take the time to do it on preparation day. You want something else on Sabbath, some little thing? Go do it on the preparation day. Make plans for the Sabbath. Associated with no cooking was not to kindle a fire. Let's look at Exodus 35, verses 2 and 3. Now this was in the wilderness. Exodus 35, verses 2 and 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be unto you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. And also, together with this, there was to be no gathering of sticks on the Sabbath day. Numbers 15, 32 to 36, you remember, there was a man that uh, was found gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And they stoned him. Now, why did they do this? In Patriot and Prophets, page 408 to 409, it says, Soon after they returned into the wilderness, this is after the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, soon after they returned into the wilderness, an instance of Sabbath violation occurred under circumstances that rendered it a case of peculiar guilt. The Lord's announcement that He would disinherit Israel had roused a spirit of rebellion. One of the people angry at being excluded from Canaan, and determined to show his defiance of God's law, ventured upon the open transgression of the fourth commandment by going out to gather sticks upon the Sabbath. So he went belligerently out there. He's going to go gather sticks on the Sabbath. During the sojourn in the wilderness, the kindling of fires upon the seventh day had been strictly prohibited. So why? Notice this. 
the prohibition was not to extend to the land of Canaan, where the severity of the climate would often render fires a necessity. But in the wilderness, fire was not needed for warmth. The act of this man was a willful and deliberate violation of the fourth commandment, a sin not of thoughtlessness or ignorance, but of presumption. So now, we know that in the uh, land of Canaan they needed warmth, and so that prohibition to kindle a fire on the Sabbath was not there. But they were to make all preparations for it nonetheless. For example, I have a wood-burning stove in my house. And in my house, uh, uh, I have wood. And on Sabbath, I don't go gathering wood. Yes, I need fire, but I don't go gathering wood on the Sabbath. What I do is on the preparation day, we make sure that in the wood box, just outside the door, right there, there is plenty of wood for the fire on the Sabbath day. I don't go out to the wood pile, or I don't go out seeking for wood. No, on the Sabbath, it is all there. And then, for the sake of warmth, when it's cold, we build a little fire. In Exodus 20, verse 10, it says, there is to be no work to be done. Exodus 20, verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. Notice here, who is to keep the Sabbath? We find oftentimes that we have visitors that come on Sabbath, relatives that come on Sabbath. What are we to do on the Sabbath when we have visitors, when we have relatives? Are we not to keep the Sabbath then? Oh no. It says here what? Even the stranger that is within thy gate. So when visitors come to my home, they cannot violate the Sabbath. Not in my home. They can come visit me another day if they want to violate the Sabbath. This verse is very clear in that regard. Even during important work periods, Exodus 34, verse 21, Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In erring time and in harvest thou shalt rest. I remember when I was growing up in Northern California. They had these big rice fields. We are in the middle of the rice paddocks. Our farm was right surrounded by all these rice fields. And when it comes time to plant the rice, even in school, they give children time off of school because they must plant that immediately. And they get on their tractors and they work 24 hours per day to get that rice into the ground. Well, on the tractors they do the preparation, they fill it up with water, and there they would sow the rice by airplanes. But nonetheless, they would work there 24 hours a day, building up all those dikes with the tractors and whatnot. And then when it comes time to harvest, again, even then, they have so much time off school. The children of farmers, those that are old enough to drive tractors, that is. And then they go into the fields and harvest that, that rice. They go in with the combines. Again, 24 hours per day. That's how important it is. Sometimes they have double shifts. But many times, I remember students coming in, telling me how they work 24-hour shifts <clears throat> in order that the harvest is done. One year, I remember they didn't get the harvest done on time. And the rain came a little bit earlier than they expected. And the rain came on those rice fields and laid the rice down. They lost a lot of time trying to harvest that rice. And they lost a lot of rice. But, as important as it is to do that harvest, God made it very clear to them that in sowing time and in harvest, they are still to do what? That's right. They are still to keep Sabbath. There are no excuses. No business operation whatsoever. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 31. Not even sometimes. We may think, oh, an occasional one is fine. No. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 31. 
And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath day or on the holy day. They were not going to buy anything from anyone on the Sabbath day. In chapter 13, verse 15 to 22, they needed to get a little bit more serious. In those days I saw in Judah some trading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into the Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did ye not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us, upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants that I at the gates, that there should be no burden brought, be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands upon you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. So you find here that the Sabbath was being disregarded among the children of Israel. And so Nehemiah made a reformation on the Sabbath issue. And we need to make a reformation today. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 21 and 22, we find here also the words on the Sabbath. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work. But hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. Here we find the importance of Sabbath keeping. Sometimes we, I see we get careless. Sometimes we say, oh, I would like to buy this book. Let me send you a check today and you bring it to me on the Sabbath. What's the difference? What is the difference? There is no difference, brother. To deliver something on the Sabbath is carrying the burden. We have no business on Sabbath. No business conducted whatsoever. Furthermore, in Acts chapter 1 verse 12, we find something here in reference to the Sabbath. Acts chapter 1 and verse 12. <clears throat> it's interesting the way Luke writes this. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. There is such a thing as a Sabbath day's journey. Sometimes we get careless in our traveling upon the Sabbath. I would like to read from volume 6, page 359 to 360. If we desire the blessing promised to the obedient, we must observe the Sabbath more strictly. I fear that we often travel on this day when it might be avoided. In other words, we need to consider when we're talking about Sabbath keeping, we need to consider that there is such a thing called a Sabbath day's journey. And if it can be avoided, we need not travel on the Sabbath. In harmony with the light which the Lord has given in regard to the observance of the Sabbath, we should be more careful about traveling on the boats or cars on this day. And the cars here is talking about railway cars. So we need to be careful on driving. On what? On the boats, railway cars. In other words, any means of transportation. Whether it be automobiles, whether it be our buses or whatever else. We need to be very careful on using these things on the Sabbath day. Not to use them unnecessarily. In these matters, we should set a right example before our children and youth. In order to reach the churches that need our help and to give them the message that God desires them to hear, it may be necessary for us to travel on the Sabbath, but so far as possible, 
we should secure tickets and make all necessary arrangements on some other day. When starting on a journey, we should make every possible effort to plan so as to avoid reaching our destination upon the Sabbath. That's right. So this is talking about careful consideration on how we deal with the Sabbath. When compelled to travel on the Sabbath, we should try to avoid the company of those who would draw attention to worldly things. We should keep our minds stayed upon God and commune with Him. Whenever there is an opportunity, we should speak to others in regard to the truth. We should always be ready to relieve suffering and help those in need. In such cases, God desires that the knowledge and wisdom He has given us should be put to use. But we should not talk about matters of business or engage in any common worldly conversation. At all times and in all places, God requires us to prove our loyalty to Him by honoring the Sabbath. And one more thing about what not to do on the Sabbath. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. Isaiah 58, verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. That's right. When we talk about the Sabbath, we have not to do our own ways. We're not to do something that is just merely pleasure. Now keep in mind, when we accept Christ in our heart, it will be our pleasure to do the will of God. Now that type of pleasure is a wonderful pleasure on the Sabbath day. I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy laws within my heart. Yes, but not our own personal pleasure merely. And further, we are not to speak our own words. We need to watch what type of words come out on the Sabbath day. We need to make sure that whatever comes out on the Sabbath is something to the honor and glory of our Creator. Now that we've talked about what not to do, I did it purposely this way. I did those things we're not to do first. Now let us consider what we are to do. I want us to finish off with these thoughts. The a good lot of time will be spent on this. What are we to do on the Sabbath day so we can keep the Sabbath day holy? First of all, to keep the Sabbath day properly, we must follow Isaiah 58, verse 14. We talked here about restoring in verse 12. We read about Sabbath, it says here, Then shalt thou call the Sabbath a delight. And then it says, Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high place of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So in other words, the Sabbath is to be enjoyed to the full. It is to be our delight. Now why is this? Well, first of all, what was the purpose of the creating of the Sabbath day? Let's look at Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So in this case here, we find that the Sabbath was made for man. It was made in our behalf. You remember in the beginning in creation, we find there that six days God worked, and then on the sixth day He made man. And it was after the creation of man that the Sabbath was instituted. Now tell me something. Can you enjoy something to its fullest while you're asleep? Is that possible? No. Therefore, volume 6, page 357 says, Let not the precious hours of the Sabbath be wasted in bed. On Sabbath morning, the family should be astir early. If they rise late, there is confusion and bustle in preparing for breakfast and Sabbath school. There is hurrying, jostling, and impatience. Thus, unholy feelings come into the home. The Sabbath thus desecrated becomes a weariness and its coming is dreaded rather than loved. So you see, you cannot enjoy the Sabbath while wasting it in bed. And when on Sabbath afternoon comes and people tell me, but I must take a nap on Sabbath, it means that they have over-exhausted themselves during the week and on Sabbath instead of being used for God, they are sleeping away those precious hours. Now, I can understand if someone is in such a condition that every single day they take a nap. I 
understand that. But if every day we are working, 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 and on the Sabbath we need two, three hours of sleep, we have robbed God of two or three hours worth of Sabbath observance. Rather, the Sabbath we should wake up earlier than the regular days of the week so we can serve God more. Let's look at Leviticus 23 and verse 3. Leviticus 23 verse 3 says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwelling. First of all, the Sabbath is what? It is not only time for a gathering, but the Sabbath is a holy convocation. If we go to church in what we consider not the holy convocation, then we're violating the Sabbath. It amazes me when someone tells me, oh, these people are wicked and I'm going to be there on Sabbath. If that's your attitude, then you are not keeping the Sabbath. Because here it says that the purpose of the Sabbath is a holy convocation. And when someone tells me that they are strong enough, that they want to go there to witness to these people, I'm sorry. That when we feel that we are so strong like that, we are definitely in a Laodicean condition and in need of help. Because God says that the Sabbath was made for us. It is made for me. I need the Sabbath. I need the Holy Convocation. This is why in the book Early Writings, there's an important passage here for us to remember in relationship to the Sabbath issue. Actually, all gatherings together for that matter. But especially when we're talking about the Holy Convocation of the Sabbath. It says here, 124, 125, early writings, the different parties of professed Advent believers have each a little truth, but God has given all these truths to His children who are being prepared for the day of God. He has also given them truths that none of these parties know, neither will they understand. Things which are sealed up to them, the Lord has opened to those who will see and are ready to understand. If God has any new light to communicate, He will let His chosen and beloved understand it, without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and error. I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we're having the last message of mercy, being separate from those who are daily imbibing new errors. We need to be separate from those who are constantly receiving errors. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings, for it is wrong to thus encourage them while they teach error that is a deadly poison to the soul and teach with doctrines the commandments of men. The influence of such gatherings is not good. If God has delivered us from such darkness and error, we should stand fast in the liberty wherewith He has set us free and rejoice in the truth. God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go. For unless He sends us to those meetings where error is forced home to the people by the power of the will, He will not keep us. Unless God specifically sends us on some occasions, and I'll say on some occasions, unless God specifically sends us on some occasions, the angels will not keep us. The angels cease their watchful care over us and we are left to the buffeting of the enemy to be darkened and weakened by him and the power of his evil angels. And the light around us becomes contaminated with the darkness. I saw that we had no time to throw away in listening to fables. Brothers and sisters, we need to listen to truth, not fables, not errors. That's why it says, and holy convocation. Our minds should not be thus diverted, but should be occupied with the present truth and seeking wisdom that we may obtain a more thorough knowledge of our position, that with meekness we may be able to give reason of our hope from the Scripture. While well, false doctrines and dangerous errors are pressed upon the mind, it cannot be dwelling upon the truth which is the fit and prepare the house of Israel to stand in the day of the Lord. So true Sabbath keeping involves what? It involves going to a holy convocation, a holy gathering. That's the purpose of the Sabbath day. Also, Acts chapter 15, verse 21. We need that time not for missionary activities. We need that time for our personal rejuvenation. Acts 15, verse 21. I'm saying missionary activities among those who don't accept the truth. But among those who come to hear the truth, yes, we should do that. 
Verse 21, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. Every Sabbath we need to be studying the Word of God. We need to be gathering together to hear the Word of God, not merely from our own selves, personally, but we need it as a group together. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, again, talks about the importance of gathering together. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see that they approach it. As we see that they approach we need to gather more often together. And especially on the Sabbath day, we need to gather to encourage each other that we may receive provoking unto love and good works. And by the way, in the context of this verse 26 says, For or because if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. In other words, the purpose of the Holy Convocation is to help us not commit the sin against the Holy Ghost. The purpose of the Holy Convocation is to help us make it to the kingdom of heaven. We need each other in church capacity, not merely in our own personal capacity. Furthermore, when we talk about Sabbath keeping, it is appropriate to do good on the Sabbath day. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 10 to 13. And behold, there was a man which had the hand withered. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? So there was a question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? He said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much more then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Now this is very clear. And verse 13, then said he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. How do we understand this passage? Well, clearly to do good on the Sabbath is part of Sabbath keeping. It is not contrary to it. How about in this work of healing? I have often found many excuses. Oh, I work in the medical field. That means I can work on the Sabbath. Is that what it means? I remember studying with somebody. And they used to work only two days a week, Sabbath and Sunday. They'd work 12 hours on Sabbath, 12 hours on Sunday. And I asked them, why is that? Well, because on those 12-hour shifts, because they are weekends, they were paying double. They would receive double wages. So they received 48 hours worth of pay for 12 hours worth of work. Half of that was on the Sabbath. And they felt comfortable with it. But... Is that what Jesus was doing? Is that what Jesus meant when he says it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? In this particular case, we have an example of what Jesus meant. He was a man with a withered hand. What did he do? He healed that withered hand. It is nothing wrong when somebody is sick to help them out. But how does that involve our work, specifically in the medical profession? We understand it in many other professions, but what about in the medical profession? Let us take a look. Medical ministry, page 50. There will always be duties which have to be performed on the Sabbath for the relief of suffering humanity. There's always going to be that. This is right and in accordance with the law of him who says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. But now listen to this. But there is danger of falling into carelessness on this point and of doing that which it is not positively essential to do on the Sabbath. So, we realize there are things that are positively essential to do on the Sabbath. But it's very easy to get careless and to do what? That which is not how? Positively essential on the Sabbath. In other words, if something is not positively essential, it means we do not do it. Let's go further. Page 160 of Medical Ministry. Speaking about the physicians and others, he is in danger of becoming confused and of failing to see the elevated holy influence which the Sabbath question is to exert on the work for this time. 
He will consider it necessary to do on the Sabbath many things which should not be done on that day. If he seeks to embrace so many responsibilities, he will come to pay very little regard to the Sabbath. Such an influence will be a curse to the institution. So to have people taking up so many burdens in the medical field on the Sabbath that they cannot keep the Sabbath day, that will be a curse to the institution. Those who are connected with our sanitariums are to be taught to regard the Sabbath question as the great test for this time. God desires His people to bind medical missionary work up with the work of the Third Angel's message. This is the work that will restore the moral image of God and man. Page 215 to 216. Again, medical ministry. Those who, from whatever cause, are obliged to work on the Sabbath are always in peril. They feel the loss, and from doing works of necessity, they fall into the habit of doing things on the Sabbath that are not necessary. So, they're doing things which are necessary, and soon what? They begin to do things which are not necessary. The sense of its sacredness is lost. And the holy commandment is of no effect. A special effort should be made to bring about a reform in regard to Sabbath observance. Now, what are we talking about? In the medical field. A special reform to do what? To make a reform in Sabbath observance. The workers in a sanitarium do not always do for themselves what is their privilege and duty. Often, listen to this, often they feel so weary that they become demoralized. This should not be. The soul can be rich in grace only as it shall abide in the presence of God. On page 214, often, Physicians are called upon the Sabbath to minister to the sick. And it is impossible for them to take time for rest and devotion. The Savior has shown us by His example that it is right to relieve suffering on this day. But physicians and nurses should do no unnecessary work. What's to do? Nothing unnecessary is to be done on the Sabbath day. Ordinary treatments and operations that can wait should be deferred till the next day. That's right. All ordinary duties must be done when? Not on the Sabbath. Let the patients know that physicians must have one day for rest. The Lord says, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. And that goes not only for physicians. How about us when we go to a physician? Shall we consider the Sabbath? I remember when I had to have uh, surgery as a result of an accident. And as I went to the surgery, the doctor said, you need to come Saturday morning to come see me. And I said, well, can't I come Friday? And he says, oh, no, there's a holiday on Thursday. And the doctor will be gone Thursday and Friday. So you must come on Saturday. And I told him, if I can wait two days because of the doctor's vacation, I can wait one more day and see him on Sunday or Monday. And they said, you can't do that. I said, I won't be here. Guess what? They had another doctor see me on Sunday. Why? It was unnecessary. They could postpone it for two days because of vacation. Well, I had to let them know that there is a God that is greater than their vacation day. And that I will not violate the Sabbath day. Volume 7. Page 106. Now this is what we should be doing. A spirit of irreverence and carelessness in the observance of the Sabbath is liable to come into our sanitariums. Upon the men of responsibility in the medical missionary work rests the duty of giving instruction to physicians, nurses, and helpers in regard to the sanctity of God's holy day. Especially should every physician endeavor to set the right example. So the physicians must be setting the right example. The nature of his duties naturally leads him to feel justified in doing on the Sabbath many things that he should refrain from doing. So far as possible, he should so plan his work that he can lay aside his ordinary duties. So, to keep the Sabbath as a physician means what? It means planning so as not to be needed on the Sabbath day. In other words, if there is an emergency situation, Yes, we are to help the person on the Sabbath. But nothing of an ordinary nature is to be done on the Sabbath day. All that should be done beforehand. 
That means in our sanitarium, on preparation day, more work is to be done to prepare so that the Sabbath can be kept faithfully according to the commandment. Volume 4, page 539. Some have made a serious mistake in neglecting to attend the public worship of God. The privileges of the divine service will be as beneficial to them as to others and as fully essential. They may be unable to avail themselves of these privileges as often as many others. Physicians will frequently be called upon the Sabbath to visit the sick and may be obliged to make it a day of exhausting labor. Such labor to relieve the suffering was pronounced by our Savior a work of mercy and no violation of the Sabbath. But those, now notice this, but those who regularly devote their Sabbath to writing or labor, making no special change, harm their own souls, giving to others an example that is not worthy of imitation and do not honor God. So those who regularly do this work on Sabbath, what are they? They are harming their own souls. In other words, it's violating God's law for us today. In volume 4, it talks about the importance of attending the religious meetings. Page 539 to 550. Some have failed to see the real importance, not only of attending religious meetings, but also of bearing testimony for Christ and the truth. If these brethren do not obtain spiritual strength by faithful performance of every Christian duty, thus coming into a closer and more sacred relation to their Redeemer, they will become weak in moral power. They will surely wither spiritually unless they change their course in this respect. There must be a reformation. Two more statements in regard to physicians before we move on or into the medical work. Medical ministry, page 216. Physicians need to cultivate a spirit of self-denial and self-sacrifice. It may be necessary to devote even the hours of the Holy Sabbath to the relief of suffering humanity. But the fee for such labor should be put into the treasury of the Lord to be used for the worthy poor who need medical skill but cannot afford to pay for it. If you would open the door to all who come freely on the Sabbath, there would be a big lineup. That's the only day they'd come. They'd be all sick. But anyway, God wants us here to take the fee is to be placed where? In the Lord's treasury for what purpose? Specifically to help the poor who cannot afford it. Finally, one statement here, Council of the Physicians, Volume 5, page 446. The duties of the physician are arduous. Few realize the mental and physical strain to which he is subject. Every energy and capability must be enlisted with the most intense anxiety in the battle with disease and death. Often he knows that one unskilled movement of the hand, even but a hair breath in the wrong direction, may send the soul unprepared into eternity. How much the faithful physician needs the sympathy and prayers of the people of God. His claims in this direction are not inferior to those of the most devoted minister and missionary worker. Be prayed as he often is of the needed rest and sleep, and even of religious privilege on the Sabbath. He needs a double portion of grace, a fresh supply daily, or he will lose his hold on God and will be in danger of sinking deeper in spiritual darkness than men of other callings. We need to pray for our brethren and sisters in the medical field, that they may uphold the law of God, that they may be faithful to the calling that God has given to them, and that they may not do common duties on the Sabbath, and that they may make sure that they avail themselves of spiritually meeting together with His people. Instead, as we notice the next sentence, yet often He is made to bear unmerited reproaches, and is left to stand alone, the subject of Satan's fiercest temptations, feeling himself misunderstood, betrayed by his friends. We need to pray for the brethren who are involved in this. Other things that we do on the Sabbath. Acts chapter 13, verse 27. Acts 13, verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew Him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning Him. Notice here, what was done every Sabbath day? The reading of the prophets. So it is appropriate for us to read the Word of God on the Sabbath day, to receive nourishment and strength from the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 16, verse 13, when there was no synagogue in one place, it says, And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, 
where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. So here on the Sabbath day, what did they do? They went by a riverside to be able to witness for the truth. So we find two things here. One, they went out in nature when there was no other place for meeting. And the other is that they were witnessing to people on the Sabbath day. Furthermore, in Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, when he talks about remember the Sabbath day, it says, because God created the heaven and earth in six days. Well, how more appropriate to spend the Sabbath than by studying the works of creation, to study the things in nature. In other words, it is appropriate for us on the Sabbath day to go out into nature and understand our God of nature. And we have some Spirit of Prophecy quotations. We have them here from Volume 6 and Volume 2. There's quite a few paragraphs here, but I want to read them and emphasize certain points as we do. Volume 6, page 358. By the way, read the whole section there. Uh, volume 6, 358 and on. And also Volume 2, uh, it's page 583 and on. That, you'll see it's a whole section there on the Sabbath issue. So we begin on Volume 6, 358. The Sabbath school and the meeting for worship occupy only a part of the Sabbath. So keep in mind, the Sabbath school is part of it. The meeting for worship is a part of it. So now, the Sabbath school and the meeting for worship occupy only a part of the Sabbath. The portion remaining to the family may be made the most sacred and precious season of all the Sabbath hours. Much of this time parents should spend with their children. In many families, the younger children are left to themselves to find entertainment as best they can. Left alone, the children soon become restless and begin to play or engage in some kind of mischief. Thus, the Sabbath has to them no sacred significance. So the Sabbath, the parents need to spend where? Oftentimes, the majority of the Sabbath need to be spent with their children. Going out in nature, doing something with the children themselves. Next part here, it says, In pleasant weather, let parents walk with their children in the fields and groves. Amid the beautiful things of nature, tell them the reason for the institution of the Sabbath. It's not just walking out in nature, going for a nature walk. It is here, telling them of the reason of the Sabbath institution. Describe to them God's great work of creation. Tell them that when the earth came from His hand, it was holy and beautiful. Every flower, every shrub, every tree answered the purpose of its Creator. Everything upon which the eye rested was lovely and filled the mind with thoughts of the love of God. Every sound was music in harmony with the voice of God. Show that it was sin which marred God's perfect work. That thorns and thistles, sorrow and pain and death are all the result of disobedience to God. Bid them see how the earth, though marred with the curse of sin, still reveals God's goodness. The green fields, the lofty trees, the glad sunshine, the clouds, the dew, the solemn stillness of the night, the glory of the starry heavens and the moon and its beauty all bear witness to the Creator. Not a drop of rain falls, not a ray of light is shed on our unthankful world, but it testifies to the forbearance of the love of God. All this is to be talked to our children as we go out in nature. It's not just a nature hike, just a nature walk. Further on, tell them of the way of salvation. How God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let the sweet story of Bethlehem be repeated. Present before the children Jesus as a child obedient to his parents, as a youth faithful and industrious, helping to support the family. Thus you can teach them that the Savior knows the trials, perplexities and temptations, the hopes and joys of the young, and that he can give them sympathy and help. From time to time, read with them the interesting stories in Bible history. Question as to what they have learned in the Sabbath school, and study with them the next Sabbath's lessons. These are all things that need to be done on the Sabbath with our children. Further on, as the sun goes down, let the voice of prayer and the hymn of praise mark the close of the sacred hours and invite God's presence through the cares of the week of labor. Oh, what a wonderful thing that needs to be done on the Sabbath day. It says here, thus parents can make the Sabbath as it should be, the most joyful day of the week. They can lead their children to regard as it is a delight. The day of days, the holy of the Lord, honorable. When I was first a Bible worker, there was a uh, 
tell me I was studying with every Thursday night. And as I gathered there Thursday evening, and after we were studying with them for a while, we taught them about how to keep the Sabbath. And on Saturday, we take the children for a walk and talk to them some of these things. And when I came Thursday evening one night, they told me, the children said, come look in our room. I said, what's there? Come look. And I came over there, and their Sabbath clothes were all ready for Sabbath. They said, we are waiting here for the Sabbath day. That's what Sabbath keeping should be to us. Now from volume 2, 583, 584, and 585 I'll be reading from. In order to keep the Sabbath holy, it is not necessary that we enclose ourselves in walls, shut away from the beautiful scenes of nature, and from the free, invigorating air of heaven. We should in no case allow burdens and business transactions to divert our minds upon the Sabbath of the Lord, which He has sanctified. We should not allow our minds to dwell upon things of a worldly character even. But the mind cannot be refreshed, enlivened and elevated by being confined nearly all the Sabbath hours within walls, listening to long sermons and tedious formal prayers. He says it's not the purpose of the Sabbath being church all day long. It, there is need of time to go out into the fresh and vigorating air. The Sabbath of the Lord is put to a wrong use if thus celebrated. The object for which it was instituted is not attained. The Sabbath was made for man to be a blessing to him by calling his mind from secular labor to contemplate the goodness and glory of God. It is necessary that the people of God assemble to talk of him, to interchange thoughts and ideas in regard to the truths contained in his word, and to devote a portion of time to appropriate prayer. But these seasons, even upon the Sabbath, should not be made tedious by their length and lack of interest. Yes, it is important for us to gather together, but not to make it to such a point that everybody is bored with it. During a portion of the day, all should have an opportunity to be out of doors. How can children receive a more correct knowledge of God and their minds be better impressed than in spending a portion of their time out of doors, not in play, but in company with their parents? Let their young minds be associated with God in the beautiful scenery of nature, let their attention be called to the tokens of His love, to man in His created works, and they will be attracted and interested. They will be led to regard Him as a tender, loving Father. They will see that His prohibitions and injunctions are not made merely to show His power and authority, but that He has the happiness of His children in view. As the character of God puts on the aspect of love, benevolence, beauty and attraction, they are drawn to love Him. You can direct their minds to the lovely birds making the air musical with the happy songs, to the spires of grass and the gloriously tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air. All these proclaim the love and skill of the heavenly artists and show forth the glory of God. Parents, why not make use of the precious lessons which God has given us in the book of nature? to give our children a correct idea of His character. Those who sacrifice simplicity to fashion and shut themselves away from the beauties of nature cannot be spiritually minded. They cannot understand the skill and power of God as revealed in His created works. Therefore, their hearts do not quicken and throb with a new love and interest, and they are not filled with awe and reverence as they see God in nature. All who love God, should do what they can to make the Sabbath a delight, holy and honorable. They cannot do this by seeking their own pleasures in sinful, forbidden amusements. Yet they can do much to exalt the Sabbath in their families and make it the most interesting day of the week. We should devote time to interesting our children. A change will have a happy influence upon them. We can walk out with them in the open air. We can sit with them in the groves and in the bright sunshine and give their restless minds something to feed upon. By conversing with them upon the works of God, and can inspire them with love and reverence by calling their attention to the beautiful objects in nature. And finally, the Sabbath should be made so interesting to our families that its weekly return will be hailed with joy. In no better way can parents exalt and honor the Sabbath than by devising means to impart proper instruction to their families and interesting them in spiritual things, giving them correct views of the character of God 
and what it requires of us in order to perfect Christian characters and attain to eternal life. Parents, make the Sabbath a delight that your children may look forward to it and have a welcome in their hearts for it. In conclusion, God calls us in Isaiah 118, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God wants us to come together and reason with Him. If we haven't been keeping the Sabbath properly, now is the time for us to evaluate it. Let us eva compare our life with what is written in God's Word. Let us not complain about the Word of God. Rather, let us make changes in our heart so that we may be that people that is recorded in Isaiah 58, verse 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt be raised up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths of dwelling. It is time for us to rise up as a people. It is time for us not to be nominal Sabbath keepers merely, but that we may be Sabbath keepers in reality that we may have entered into the rest that we talked about before, the spiritual rest of Sabbath, and that that may be shown by our literal Sabbath keeping. And that this literal Sabbath keeping will help us to go to further heights into our entering into the rest of God. And the Lord help us that this may be our experience, my friends.